It was a privilege and honor to be away in Africa. We were in Africa last week. A team of us went, and, and some of them in church today, and what an incredible time. Well, just real quick, just a couple of quick stories. We were in Zimbabwe, and uh, we started with a feeding program. We pulled up to this, this, this school at Chizuma Village, and they were getting ready to host a soccer tournament. And in the soccer tournament, six different schools from Victoria Falls was coming out to this school at Chizuma Village uh, to their school to be able to play the tournament. Now, these six schools that were coming are going to be able to feed their kids because they've raised support and they have food for the kids. But these kids in this school were going to have to sit back and watch them eat. Now, you know, that's a tough thing. So we pull up in a truck. We have the food on the truck. They have no idea. The leadership and the staff had just come together, and they prayed, God, we don't have any food to feed them. Make a way. They had no clue that we were about to pull up and bless them with food. They prayed, God answered, he provided. It comes from where you least expect it. When you least expect it, God will show up. God hears the prayers of his people, amen? We were able to be in a pastor's conference with 60 different churches uh, represented. We had uh, just a great opportunity to pour and invest in the lives of leaders. And one of the greatest ways to have the best influence is to, is to breathe life into leaders and watch them breathe life and to the followers that they have. And it was a privilege and an honor for us to be able to do that in a two-day pastor's conference as well as preach six different services on Sunday morning last week along with Saturday morning we were in churches. It was a good opportunity, a good opportunity to see God's hand at work and the great things that God is doing. So privilege and honor. We'll be sharing more about that. And also, before we jump in, summer surge, grab your neighbor's kids that are outside making a bunch of noise early in the morning, load them up in your car and take them to church. All right, grab them, take them, bring them, invite them, bring them. It's free, it's for the community, it's for all the kids. Bring them, they will not regret it. It'll be an incredible time. And if you're looking to volunteer and you signed up out there, we'll be giving you a shout and uh, to be able to hook you up with the opportunity. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, let's read together. It says, Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder you shall not commit adultery in verse 15 where we'll be today you shall not steal now the first four that are covered in the ten commandments that god speaks to the children of israel in front of this mountain where he gives these principles to moses because he's delivered them and he set them free from bondage from slavery from the egyptian captivity and he's saying, I've set you free. Now I want to teach you how to live free. This is the beautiful part of what God is saying. And the first four deal with how to honor him. How many of you know it's important that if we don't learn how to honor God, it doesn't matter how we try with each other because we're going to get it wrong. Whether it comes to family, marriage, whether it comes to being a neighbor, whether it comes to being an employer or an employee, if we don't get this right, this is always going to go south. You can look at marriages and see it, when, when we lose our way of who we're supposed to be worshiping and giving our efforts, when we lose that position of honor towards the Lord, when He, when he deserves everything and we, we take Him off of the rightful place and the throne of our life, then we are going to fumble a lot of things in life. And God's telling them, you've got to get this correct. And then He goes on after the first four. He says, now the next six are going to be how you deal with relationships. In the first one, when he says, honor your father and mother, I believe it's essential that we understand that if you can't honor the simplest authority that God has set over your life that you have seen, what makes you think you can obey the authority you've never laid eyes on? As a youth pastor for years, I told teenagers, don't act all spiritual up in here raising your hands and you won't mind your parents. Oh, y'all, parents, you missed a good opportunity right there. Act out, well, I got to get to church. I can't clean my room. I got to, I can't do what you told me to do because my parents just don't get me. They ain't as spiritual as I am. Okay. There are going to be a whole lot of people in life ain't as spiritual as you, trust me. But honor isn't about, there, there were no footnotes that said, as long as they never raise their voice, <laughs> as long as they never give you too many rules, as long as they never ground you. Remember a kid coming to April and I one time and said, I need your help. My parents locked me upstairs in a room. 
And she was 16. My mom was screaming, her eyes twitching. You ever raise a teenager? No, they'll make your eyes twitch. I said, did they feed you? Mm-hmm. Okay. You have something to drink? No, I am. You probably deserve to be locked up. <laughs> Expect me to go against... Look, I'm not saying that you need to go home and lock your kids. I'm just saying that it's amazing to me that kids will come and they'll say things about their parents and give half the truth. They grounded me for no good reason whatsoever. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they sit around thinking of ways to make your life horrible. Honor. So honor your father and your mother so you live long in the land the Lord our God has given you. And then he says, don't murder. Don't kill them. <laughs> don't kill each other. Learn how to live in life without killing people. Now, I think that we're not carrying weapons today to be able to hurt each other in service. But the simple fact of it is that we kill each other by the choices we make, the words that we speak, and the things that we don't let go of. The hate. God is trying to teach His children, you're going to be together. I'm trying to bring unity, but you're going to have every opportunity to have division. And if you will not do these things, if you will learn how to honor what's above you, if you will learn, if you will learn how not to slaughter someone with selfish ambition so that you can do something, you'll be better for it. Oh yeah, And don't commit adultery. What he's saying is don't become perverted on the inside long before it manifests on the outside. When you see the commandment, don't commit adultery, it's really like, oh, yeah, that's okay. I'm for married as long as I'll cheat. Do you know that adultery doesn't manifest itself publicly? It's what you do when nobody else is looking that will eventually manifest itself publicly. And so some things perversion will try to capture you from the inside first to try and derail you. He's saying, look, honor don't kill each other. Don't become perverted. And then don't steal. Don't steal from one another. Don't steal what is not yours. Now we think that this would be something so practical and so easy that it doesn't take a mental giant to figure out or a spiritual theologian to say, oh yeah, don't. this is easy. But how many things in our life have either been stolen or we have stolen from someone. Don't steal. Why? Because when you steal from someone, it is a violation. It is a violation against them. I don't know. Have, is anybody in here just about a show of hands ever had something stolen from you? Leave your hand up if it felt good. All right. I can tell you that I understand when things come up missing, like you go in your garage, you're like, man, what is, man, I, I used to have an extension cord there. Isn't it amazing that people can look at something you own and think you don't deserve it, it should be theirs? They don't even ask to borrow it. Here's the crazy thing. Most of us, if someone would just ask to borrow it, we would let them have it. What about when you go to Walmart? And you're leaving in the parking lot, and you didn't intentionally take anything, but there it is at the bottom of your cart, a little dollar fifty something that was underneath the water. You didn't see it, and they didn't either. And all you're left with is your integrity. Right? You're out there, and the Lord's saying, don't steal. Why? Because regardless if anybody else would know it, He knows it, and you know it. And your integrity's not worth a dollar fifty. <laughs> Take it back in, and if they choose to bless you with it, let it happen. But don't sit out in that parking lot and be like, oh, I guess the Lord's trying to bless me right now. <laughs> no, He ain't trying to bless you. He's testing you. <laughs> Walk through the parking lot, see $100. Oh, the Lord is good today. Gave me $100 right out of this parking lot. You find cash, you take it. If somebody else steals it, it's on them. Listen to me. If I do what God has asked me to do, I'm okay with that. If somebody else does it and does not honor the Lord, that's on them. It's not on me. You go and you, you can find something that someone's lost. Most of the time, their heart is to reward you. Like, man, that's awesome. Being at Walmart, I remember going back in and said, hey, I, I don't think you rung this up. Well, I'm actually pretty sure you didn't ring this up. 
I was at Lowe's not too long ago. We were doing, we were transitioning and living in a temporary home until we finished building ours. And and there was a drill that was in there. It was on the bottom shelf and it pay and leave. And the person was trying to check me out quickly. And I get to the to the car and I'm looking through the receipt and I'm loading. I'm going, that price doesn't sound right. They took everything off of it, but I was going through the receipt and it didn't ring it up. It was a skill saw that was on sale. A skill saw, like I needed one. I needed to cut some stuff. And I'm out there loading it in my truck going, it's not on the... Surely they... And I'm going through, it's dark outside. You know, I could have waited until I got home where I had some light, you know, all the excuses you can come up with. I'm looking and I'm like, oh. See, crazy thing is, I worked at Lowe's when I was in Bible college. So I knew taking it back in to risk them getting in trouble, but it's okay. I'd rather them get in trouble than me not have integrity. And I go back in and I said, Hey, I don't think you rang this up. He goes, oh, yeah, I did. So I'm pretty sure you didn't. Look through. Like, oh, no, I didn't. Oh, well, uh, uh, I said, but here's the good thing. Is now seeing it, is I don't want it. So I just saved myself $130. <laughs> so here, I keep it. That was the Lord saying, you don't need it. You don't need it. I, and that Tuesday, somebody brought me a skill saw because they had an extra one in their garage and blessed me. Can I tell you? You don't have to steal to get what God wants you to have. He's saying, if I'm the one who provides, if I'm the one who will bring water from a rock, if I'll bring manna from heaven, if I will make a cloud to cover you by day and a fire to guide you by night, I will not make you have to steal to get what you need. Don't steal. Father's Day 2012 is on a Sunday, just like every Father's Day is. We go to bed that late that night, living in central Arkansas. I wake up, getting ready. April walks out the hallway to go start getting the kids awake. How many of you know that sometimes that can be a chore in and of itself on a Sunday morning? She walks out of our bedroom into the hallway to take a left, and she goes, Baby, did you leave the garage open? I said, Mm-mm. She opened it up, and she said, Our car is gone. I was like, Oh, I may have left it outside. I may not have pulled it in the garage. I don't know what I did. How many of you know when you sleep, you forget things? So wake up, and the car is nowhere. It's nowhere, y'all. Somebody got in our garage that was closed around 2.33 in the morning, stole our vehicle, took it and run it all over the place, stole from us. Now, we're getting ready to go to church, Okay. We're getting ready to go to church. We feel good about church that morning. And all of a sudden, we ain't got a ride. I mean, my truck's out there. It's on the... But Mama's car ain't there. How many of you know Mama likes her car? Well, middle of that night, some individuals got in our garage. Our neighbors are in the next house, too. That's why they're our neighbors. And in their bathroom window at around 3 in the morning, they saw brake lights come on. They thought we were just getting home late from a youth function or a church function. But it was them backing out, and they decided it would be good to have a derby in our car and run over all kinds of mailboxes. Now, here's, here's what's crazy. Is you know that a thief never thinks about what it costs you to have what you have? The nicest car I'd ever owned up to that point. The thief had no idea how hard it was to be able to finally get my wife something that was that nice. What it had to do in the rebuilding of credit from things that my father had done. What it had to do to come up with the money to put it down. The things, the things that the blessing that it took for us to get there took it from us. I felt violated. I felt violated because they came in our garage, and right off our garage is my daughter's bedroom. I was thankful that the car is all they wanted. And so I'm, I'm thinking, this person came into my house, and so I felt vulnerable. I felt unprotected. I felt like I felt violated to the umpteenth degree. <laughs> but we didn't skip church that day. We got, went ahead and got dressed, called the law. The police came out. We were at church by first service. Up in there smiling, worshiping. The devil took I'll take it on back. You know, we're singing about victory. We... You know, God's going to be all these. And we get a call after church. They found our vehicle here. They called and they said, uh, Mr. Hunt, I think we found your vehicle. Oh, where at? We we'll need you to come identify. Well, you can't see it? Well, it's a little. You just need to come out. 
And we go out there, and I'm like, what? I mean, inside that vehicle are my kids' bat bags. We've been at all-star tournaments. All these little kids did, they took and they stole and violated something that we had worked hard for, run it off into a what we call a bayou, and ruined it. It was selfish, it was undeserved, and it was unneeded. But a thief doesn't care how it inconveniences you. They did it just because they wanted to have something to do. They got bored. They originally stole the purse, and in the purse there was no cash and no credit card. It was just debit cards and checks. So they threw all that out in the front yard by a bush, and when they realized the keys were in there, they come back in and took the vehicle and run it down a road close to ours and run down in ditches and tore over mailboxes and got to this creek and said, we'll drive down in here, we'll set it, and we'll just drive it off in there. Not thinking about it. You know, the frustrating thing is, did you have insurance? Yes, I had insurance. But it doesn't matter. I don't have insurance so my car can get stolen. I have insurance to protect me from me. <laughs> Sometimes I don't see everything when I'm driving. So I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about the, the fact that we've been stolen from, and then I didn't know how to feel about it because did, did the insurance company cover the cost? Yes, they did. And did we get another vehicle? Yes, but I didn't know how to feel about it because then started my introductory to the world of minivans. Look, there's a long-term payout when the devil steals from you. I didn't want a minivan, but my wife, with that smile and that little glare, and I said, baby, I want a minivan. Be easy. I was like, I don't want a minivan. I can't be driving no minivan. I can't do it. Can I tell you now, I love them. You can get them things loaded a lot cheaper, and you can get that SUV that gets about eight, gallons, <laughs> eight miles a gallon. I'm thinking... The enemy stole was something very real, something very violated that morning. It took out our wallets and stuff. We had to change our cards over. We had to open a different account. We had to do all of those things. When you're stolen from, it's very aggravating to say the least. Man, it's the nicest car we'd own. Had to get my kids new gloves. They couldn't break them in. All stars, no matter how many machines, or put them under a mattress or things that you do and, and so on and so forth. Now, I can tell you that I've never stolen a vehicle. Never taken. So it wasn't a, oh, well, you must have sown some seeds so you, had what, you got what you had coming. Can I tell you, when you get stolen from, it's not you getting what you had coming. It's when the enemy comes in to steal. It's what he does. And God's saying to his children, you don't act like that. You don't act like it. Now, today, I don't think we're in threat of anybody leaving here still in each other's vehicle. I don't think that you would go into someone's house and rob it intentionally. But I do think that there are ways that we steal. The first one is this. I believe we steal as a neighbor. We steal our time and we steal our affection and we steal the common courtesy of just getting to know them. We steal from the opportunities that we have to make Jesus' name famous as a neighbor. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. When you look at the fact that he's calling these children to live together, they're supposed to live together in unity in a land that he's promised. And he's trying to teach them how to do it. He's saying, look, if you will not steal from one another the things that I've guided and directed you to do, you will be healthy. When we steal from each other, it doesn't make us stronger. It makes us more divided. When we've been stolen from in life, we put up rails and guards to not let people back into those areas. When your purity is stolen, when your loyalty is stolen, when things are stolen from you that don't have a price tag and don't just have a door and they walk in and take, when things are stolen from you that were not meant to be, things that the Lord wanted to bless you with so that you could bless others, the enemy doesn't care. He wants to steal. He wants to violate. And I think we steal as a neighbor sometimes. Now, this is, this is just for free. If you borrow something, if you've had it a year, it doesn't come become yours. <laughs> Offer to return it. Why do I say that? Because I am the world's worst. <laughs> that whenever I borrow something, one time I was thinking, I was getting, last year I was getting ready for this message. Uh, you said, well, did you, no, so I just get ready for messages, and it was just now that the timing came and I had about eight different things I'd borrowed from someone because they had a lot of stuff that was cool 
And they were like, hey, you want to borrow? I was like, hey, you need to borrow? He's like, yeah, I need a sledgehammer. Yeah, I'll borrow. Hey, do you need, can I get a hydraulic jack? I was like, oh, this is, sure beats the other jack that gets under there. It's got about three different pieces that you can't figure out how to work when you need it. Well, that hydraulic jack was nice. And I got to thinking about it. They shouldn't have to come back to my house to borrow what's rightfully theirs. So I took it back. I took it back so that way when I preached this message over a year later, they wouldn't be able to say, hey, time out, preacher. Remember that, Jack? Remember? Now they can't be saying that. Because the person I borrowed it from has a faithful friend that'll throw it in my face. We don't steal as a neighbor. Let me tell you another way that we steal. We overpromise and we underdeliver. I think we do it as employers. Listen to me. Let me say that it damages the reputation of the gospel of Jesus Christ when those who fly the Jesus banner over their life don't follow through with the commitments that they make to their employees. Because the first thing they say is, oh yeah, that guy goes to church on Sunday. She goes to church on They raise their hands. They sing their songs. But when they show up on Monday, they don't remind me of Jesus. They remind me of Judas. They're takers and not givers. They're not good for the obligations that they've given. And it happens everywhere you go. If you're a boss or you're in charge or you own your own company, don't overpromise and underdeliver. The first position that I was in, I was told, we will give you health insurance if the church grows by eight families. Well, we grew by 20 families. And whenever it got time to do health insurance, it's like, ah, we can't do that. I don't care if you got to move heaven and shake earth. If you promise insurance, if we grow eight, if we grow 20, you make it happen. Why? Because your integrity is all you got. And you think, well, I mean, the economy went rough. It was, no, I'm very big. People, I, it's a huge thing for me as an individual to just do what you say you're going to do. And if you overexceed it, let that be land yet. Let that be blessing. But don't underdeliver. When people come in like, Pastor, if you could just, you know, if you could do this, just saying maybe one day you will. It's like, I'm not doing that. Because that one day may not come and you'll be mad. But if I tell you exactly what we'll do, that's all we'll do. But at least we were honest. It happens everywhere you go. I was promised a bonus in a place that I worked. A bonus that was mine was going to be spread out through the year. Almost $18,000. Did I get it? Absolutely not. Well, what happens? It can wound your heart when someone steals what has been promised to you. It's stealing. It's not having the heart to bless someone when you overpromise and underdeliver. But what about as an employee? Today, if you work for somebody or you, you hold a job or a position where you have a boss, can I tell you that as employees, stealing is such a massive problem that it's almost impossible for organizations to calculate the total loss so they estimate what their companies lose, and it's around $200 billion a year that employees will steal out of stock and supplies. In addition to stealing items, employees are guilty of stealing time. Any of you ever wasted time at work? There's a report on salary.com that says the average employee wastes a little over two hours a day. In an eight-hour workday, a one-hour lunch that is given, two hours wasted, some people will look and say, what's the big deal? It doesn't bother me. Well, what if it was your company? Can I tell you? Your work is your witness. Don't steal. But I'm not taking money. Look, if you are goofing off and not working, look, remember he said work six days. Work, work hard. But on the seventh, you better give me the glory for it. Nothing wrong with working hard. There ain't a lot of people probably about to burn out from working too hard. They just want to play a bunch. And you see this issue of employees who are stealing time and goofing off on the internet and, and doing all kinds like, oh, I if they ask you not to do it, you just don't do it. Why? Because you are a faithful witness. See, it's not fun, is it? You thought don't steal. We just ain't going to take from each other. But can I tell you that we steal in more ways that are obvious? And I think God wants to do a, pure, a purity, a purifying of our hearts, of our churches. He wants to do something deep in us so that our work is our witness. Why? Because when you tote that I'm the Jesus follower and you do stuff like that, you make it hard when the next Jesus follower comes along needing a job some kind of bad. 
I get saved in this church in Rayville. I'm going to Bible college at some point. I needed a job. I was wanting to go to school. I was, I'm not, I was wanting to go to school at Bible college, but in the meantime, I was wanting to go to work at a jewelry store. Now, the people at the jewelry store, I knew them. He was an all-star coach, an all-star umpire. I played ball. I knew him. He knew my family. My dad and him were friends at one time before he went off the deep end. But I thought, man, this guy, they're going to hire me. Went in and interviewed with them. They were going to train me how to do jewelry. It was a great job until I went to college. It was going to do crazy things like pay our bills. Let us be able to get food, be able to afford gas, and then the other car that we ain't drove in a while. It was going to be a beautiful opportunity. And she said, she did because it was a lady. She said, Johnny, it just makes sense for us to hire you, but let me tell you why I'm not going to. So I'm like, yes, why? Heartbroken. Because we hired a guy from your church where you go, right, over here? First Assembly, that's where you go, yeah. We hired a guy, and he came in here, and he interviewed well. Customers would come in, and I'd be looking for him. Hey, where? And I'd go into a room, and he'd be in the room praying like this. Facing the wall, away from her. And she'd say, hey. And she'd call him by name. say, hey. And he'd say, I'm praying. And go back. Can I tell you that when you work for somebody, your work is your witness? Don't you steal from them and pretend to be spiritual. Mark Driscoll tells a story when he worked at a Marriott. He talks about a guy that was there, a young guy like him, new Christian, that people would come up and need things. He'd be reading his Bible, and they'd interrupt and say, Sir, can you get me? He'd say, I'm reading my Bible. Can I tell you that nobody's impressed that you read your Bible whenever you don't have a good work ethic for the job you're getting paid to do? Don't steal from your employers. If you don't like who they are or what they've done, then you be faithful where you are until God provides another opportunity. But don't wave the Jesus banner and be stealing from somebody. Oh, you missed a good chance to say amen. Is that too tough? Oh, that's tough, isn't it? You thought when he said don't steal, he was talking to them. But no, he's talking to us. Let's don't steal from one another. We don't have to. Why? Because we don't own it. He does. And what we do, we do for His honor and His glory. Your work is your witness. Let me tell you another way that we steal, and then we're going we're to close this up today. I believe we steal when wealth becomes our God. You know, we don't talk about money a whole lot in church, though Jesus spent a good percentage talking about it in the New Testament. And what I've learned is the only people that get mad when you talk about money in church are the ones whose money's become their God. Oh, it's tough today. I came all the way back from Africa to talk to y'all like this. <laughs> Talking to us. Look, sometimes we need to be reminded to be faithful with what God asks. Word says, will a man rob me? I would never want to steal from God. If God owns the cattle in a thousand hills and he only asks for 10% and he'd make my 90 go further than the 100 ever will, then what, what, why would I not? You'd be faithful with what God asks. It's kind of like this. I have a truck that's outside. If Joe Gillespie says, hey, Pastor John, can I borrow your truck? Should I be impressed that he brings it back? <laughs> that's how we act whenever we're faithful to God. God should be impressed. I did what he told me to do. <laughs> I gave him back what's rightfully his. God's not impressed with our sacrifice. He's impressed with our obedience. Look, we don't want to steal. It's not in our heart. It's not what we desire to do. We, don't, we want to be a faithful worker. We want to be a faithful boss. We don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. I know that. I know that we don't want to be a bad neighbor. I know this. We don't want to, we don't want to steal. And, and we don't want to take things that aren't rightful. We don't want to rob anybody. I know that. I think sometimes we do it unintentionally. We just need to be reminded. So today, I'm going to give you three things I want you to walk away with. Number one is this. Don't steal because somebody already has that job. The mission statement of the enemy, his life's mission, 
John summed it, uh, Jesus summed it up in John chapter 10, verse 10. In the first part of that verse, he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He's telling his children, Don't steal because there's going to be somebody trying to violate you the rest of your days. Don't do it to each other. Don't steal. Somebody already has that job. The enemy got up early this morning just to mess with you, to steal you of your victory, to steal you of your opportunity, to steal you of a clear mind so that you could receive. The enemy was up early working this morning to steal from somebody. It's what he does. Satan is a deceiver who will attack your mind with lies. He is an accuser who will attack your heart with accusations. And he's a destroyer who will attack your pride against your will. He will attack you where your will will be so full of pride that you can't say you're sorry. that You've done something wrong. He comes to steal your joy. He comes to steal your peace. He comes to steal your sanity. So we don't need to do what the father of this world does we have to do what our father in heaven is and that's to be a life giver don't steal somebody's already got that job number two let's not make it easy i love when joshua said as for me and my house you don't want your car stolen how many of you lock your door you lock the front door of your house if you're going to like things that are just temporary, let's put some locks on our life personally, over our marriages, over our families. Let's don't make it easy access for an intruder. Boundaries are a good thing. Boundaries are a good thing. Let's not make it easy to be stolen from. You say, well, Pastor, your car was stolen because it was easy. No, my car was stolen because when a thief wants to be a thief, you can't make them honest. At least make them have to work for it. They were so deceitful. My garage wasn't open. I had a silent screw garage door that you couldn't hear when it opened. I love that part of it, except for when we got robbed from. Now I want a garage that plays like a loud trumpet so I can go out and bless them. They come up and pried the door open through their foot underneath. So when the door tried to close on it, it, it confused the, the computer, the, the motor, and made it think something was pinned, and so it raised all on its own. Why? Because a thief learns how to get around the system. I can tell you this, we didn't leave our keys in the vehicle after that. In a purse. It was almost impressive they found the keys because I've been in my wife's purse. <laughs> Boundaries are a good thing. Don't steal. That's, some, that's, that's the enemy's job. Don't, don't steal. But let's not make it easy. Then here's the beautiful part of the life of a believer is we get to make it right. We get to make it right. Can I tell you, restitution is the only response for the redeemed. Amen? Restitution is the only response for the redeemed. Zacchaeus was saved, and when he was saved, he had made his living taking advantage of people and stealing from them as a tax collector. And when he came to Jesus, he said, I'll pay back everything. I t I'll make it right. Now, just to make it personal, I'll tell you something that happened to me. In the process of working for family Christian bookstores before I went to college, I went through a process to where I couldn't find a job because I was hard-headed. I was making great money, and then I just said, you know, God, he provided me with this and provided me with another one. I wasn't a faithful co-worker. And God taught me a lot of lessons through that season. And I told God, if you'll give me a job, I'll work there and I'll be faithful until I go to Bible college. And God gave me exactly what I asked making less than half the money I'd made. Barely above minimum wage. As a supervisor. 40 hours a week. And I was faithful. 
faithful there. But the cool thing was, is as an employee of Family Christian Bookstores, I could check out items for personal use. And so what happened was I checked out this Bible. It was a New King James Version. I had other Bibles. I had a living, I had an NIV, Living uh, uh, Life Application Study Bible. I had a MacArthur. I had a Finnis Dake. I had, but I wanted to just kind of read through this one. Well, they came in and did inventory through the process of me working there, and I wasn't there for inventory. They hire a third-party company, comes in and does it, and they wipe the Bible off the shelf as it, as it was a loss, as if it was stolen. And I come back in, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I didn't know that was going to happen. They didn't ever ask me. I didn't. I didn't want to have a moment where I said, Lord, I guess you blessed me with a Bible, didn't you? I mean, the last thing I ever want to be is a preacher that preaches from a stolen word. <laughs> what I do? Act like it never happened? No, because integrity is all you have. You restitute and you make it right. You go to the proper person in authority and you tell them what happened and you let the cards fall where they will. They could have run me through the ringer, could have said all kinds of ugly things. It wasn't my intention. Now, how many of you know you're not judged on your intentions? I said, all right. Had the conversation. And I got the Bible. Then I could make notes in it. Spent years preaching from it. Had thumb index to get me to the... Because as a new Christian, I didn't know all the books in their order. Somebody named a book in the Old Testament. I'm like, oh, thank you for thumb index. It was given. Could have acted like it never happened, but I would have known. And when I preached a message like this, I would have been convicted. But a free conscience is when you make it right. Look, I don't know what it is that you may have to make right, what you may have stolen, what you may have taken, or maybe it's not. Maybe you've had something done to you. Well, maybe today it's time for you to forgive what someone has violated in you, and you make it right. Making it right says you're not going to allow the thief to have any victory over where you are. Don't steal. And if you've been stolen from, don't let the hate rob you of an opportunity to live at peace with all people. Stand with me.